without further ado, um, I'd like to briefly introduce you to today's speakers, John Kielsen, VP of Product at AMC, and Ross Schwaber, Senior Director of Product Management at Bleacher Report, as well as your moderator, and Particles SVP of Technical Solutions, Paul Mander. All right, thanks, Abril. Uh, let's get started. Maybe, um, John and Ross, why don't you tell us a little bit more about uh, what your roles are at AMC and Bleacher, respectively. So, John, if you could go first. Sure. Um, so, yeah, as VP of Product at AMC, I manage a team of product managers, and we build out um, and maintain the direct-to-consumer apps for uh, AMC Networks, BBCA, IFC, WeTV, and Sundance. Um, so we're building our like direct to consumer expression of how users would access our our latest and greatest content. All right, and Ross. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm the senior director of product at Bleacher Report, and uh, I oversee our, uh, our our core news business. So what you consider cons you think of as our, our the Bleacher Report app and the website. And I also oversee our kind of entry into uh, to sports betting. Cool. Yeah, so let's jump into things a little bit. You know, so when you think about um, product and product-led growth, right, and, you know, when you look at the media space, uh, on the surface, everyone, everyone says, well, you know, hey, guys, it's the content that's the product, right? That's really what gets people into things. But uh, what do you guys see as product's role for growth in, in the media space? Uh, maybe, Ross, we'll start with you on this one. So... At Bleacher Report, we're, we're trying to bridge the gap between being a, a publisher and, and kind of a platform. So we don't necessarily just want to be the place where you go to read about sports. We also want to be the place that you go kind of to experience sports and talk about sports with your friends. So um, if you take a step back a couple of years ago, what we've noticed is that the 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 platforms are getting more distributed, right? So we have... Apple News, and we have AMP pages, and we have uh, and and we have a lot of formats we, that we kind of don't control. Facebook Instant Articles. Um, so as we at the trying to bring people into our O and O uh, site and get them uh, to engage with each other and see the value there was something that was really important to us. So if you're starting to talk about uh, product-led growth and, and you're starting to talk about uh, the, uh, the, the idea that uh, a publisher, I, I think in this day and age, a publisher has to be actually more than their content. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Um, I would say at AMC, um, you know, our, our applications, what we're building for our consumers on the different platforms are focused on getting the user to the content as quickly as possible, sort of what you mentioned, which is sort of table stakes, right, for for a video company in general. Um, so a lot of what we do is sort of uh, getting to that place of table stakes, but at the same time trying to create a differentiated experience, something that's going to be uh, more appealing to to the AMC customer, the BBCA customer specifically, and, and try to create a uh, sort of a holistic ex content experience for the user. Um, so when we think about product like growth, it's a combination of uh, opportunity sizing, identifying where there is opportunity for that growth, whether it's, you know, new platforms, new features, and then um, I think Ross had mentioned previously, uh, sort of optimization, right? Trying to get the user past all of that friction. Ultimately, we're trying to get them to the content that they love sooner than later. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that I'll add there is that if you start to go down this uh, this path, it's right. I think a lot of brands view the social networks as an just solely as an acquisition platform, and we've always taken the approach of let's let our voice match the voice of that platform, and people will engage with our brand and then want to engage with our O and O property rather than it just be like a blatant like post this link, post this link, post this link. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. We have a similar strategy, I'd say, where we're, we're essentially, there's a combination of like our owned and operated is probably like hopefully the, the best place where you can consume that content and be 
more uh, enveloped in that content, but off platform, on social, et cetera, we're still trying to basically bring our content to where the, the consumer is so that they, because uh, it's hard it's hard to change their habits, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so, so it's almost like you guys are saying like, rather than, you know, hey, Facebook, we're just gonna dump links there and use it to drive traffic. Like that's an extension of your user experience even, right? An extension of your, of your content uh, versus just like, uh, the goal being to get people to your site or to your app. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, and, uh, you know, we were one of the, you know, we were always one of the questions on panels or, or about challenges. I think it's interesting not to sound insensitive, right? But certainly the media industry is doing well uh, in digital, digitally speaking, right? Given, given COVID, but kind of putting aside that, that growth that we're seeing due to these unfortunate circumstances. What, what do you guys see as really the biggest challenge uh, in, in pro for product leaders in, the, in your space right now? Do you... I don't know, Ross, you want to go first? You want me to take it? Yeah. Um, where? John, why don't you? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So the, I would say, I mean, we're, yeah, I think we're both in a similar place where we're fortunate in that, yes, there's more viewers, there's more eyeballs, there's more people available to consume the content. Um, so I would say our metrics are up. Um, I think the challenge right now to be, be candid, and I think a lot of people know about this is uh, market gets impacted, so advertising gets pushed, and a lot of our money comes from advertising. Um, so that that becomes a, a, a challenge currently. Um, so I think it becomes how do we find newer, creative ways to to monetize the content um, with our sales teams? Um, you know, we, we obviously have a, a subscription business as well, so that's obviously performing fairly well because of this. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily fair to say that we're in the same boat as, as other industries, um, like you said. Um, so the challenge is a little different. I think on the video side, we also, um, uh, the the space is pretty crowded, right? There's a lot of direct to consumer being that my team is building direct to consumer apps. There's a lot of them out there. Um, so we're all competing for those users. And that is where content is going to differentiate us, um, content and timeliness of the content. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh Kind of, kind of building on this. I, we, we're in the attention economy, right? Yeah. And uh, and and we don't uh, we we don't we we compete as much with Instagram and Facebook as we do with ESPN, right? Uh, so what we're what we're looking for is to create experiences that engage beyond that. Here, read this article or watch this video, and read this article and watch this next video. So. What is it that we're trying to get people to do on the BR platform? It's it's getting them to start to create their own content. It's uh, it's getting them to engage with other users, make it feel more like a community, so that when they're bored and they're sitting on their phone, it's not I'm going to open up Facebook or I'm going to open up Instagram or I'm going to open up Snapchat. It's I'm going to open up Bleacher Report so that because that's where I go to kind of live my kind of best sports life, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's something that I care. And it's something that obviously uh, we're in a little, even as a publisher, we're in, I think a more unique situation because when all of this started, like live sports went away. Um, yeah. yeah. So in the past, uh, in the past few weeks, we've had to get very creative in creating engaging content um, that, that really got the fans, to, to stay with us through through this pretty tough time, right? And uh, and we we've done some fun things to engage our community and kind of uh, you know take the people's minds off the fact that they're kind of stuck in their house. Um, last week, for instance, I got to participate in a running a fake NBA team for a week and do trades, and I had the users engaging with me and sending me DMs and and and, and comments and. And judging my trades, and even the Philadelphia Press picked up on. I was running the fake Sixers, and even the Philadelphia Press picked up on my trades and started doing analysis. So I think everybody's kind of craving that content right now, mm -hmm. and craving that engagement and that interaction. Who was your first pick? 
my first pick, my first trade w- didn't go down that well. I traded Tobias Harris and Josh Richardson for Buddy Heald and a couple other players, and uh, people people were not happy. I, Philadelphia <laughs> sports fans are a tough audience. <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> yeah, if, if you could make it managing a sports team in that market, I think uh, you know business challenges or the other business challenges are easy compared to that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of speaking about, uh, you know, you, you mentioned, right, uh, specifically Ross for, for your business, right, the impact of, uh, of, of COVID and, and what, it's, uh, what it's had. And obviously sports is one of the more impacted things. Um, maybe uh, turning it to, to John a little bit, you know, so with the, all the stuff that has changed with COVID, and I you know, briefly mentioned that for media, it's been some, some positive impact. But um, of these changes that you've seen, do you see any things that you feel will be a permanent shift in uh, consumer behavior or for the, specifically for the media business that are, that are coming out of COVID? Um, I mean, ho- hopefully not, honestly. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, we like the increase, uh, viewership, but we also don't want everyone staying home forever. It's not, you know, yeah. um, uh, I think from an advertising standpoint, um, You know, I think they're like I mentioned the impact there, the sort of negative impact, but I think there'll be some shift in consumer habits because of that, right? So I think ultimately, um, when you know some of this will come back when when markets are are coming back, there'll be uh, more increased online purchases, and that ultimately helps on the advertising space. Um, So I think from that standpoint, it'll be uh, we'll end up in a in a better price long term. So mm-hmm. um, I think it's more so uh, obviously the the impact to us individually working within our organizations is it's very different uh, experience, d- different for everyone. Right. Uh, having to be completely remote. And um, there's some challenges that come along with that. I think there's probably longer term impact to how companies operate um, more than anything. Um, most likely more flexibility. We're seeing that with companies like Twitter where they're, they're essentially just allowing everyone to work from home forever. Um, yeah. So I think that's a, probably a bigger impact. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys are on a webinar hosted by Importicle, so you know we're going to talk <laughs> about data. Uh, uh, so maybe transitioning to data a little bit. Uh, sure. So maybe maybe let's start a little bit about uh, your experiences uh, with Importicle. Uh, maybe I'll turn it to Ross first, since John, you were doing some talking. Sure. Uh, what do you think has changed the most for for kind of your you as a product person uh, in terms of pre Importicle to now that you have the Importicle infra- data infrastructure in place? Yeah, I, I think there, there's a few things, but I'll start with, uh, you know, at, at a few years ago at Bleacher Report, we decided that we were going to re-instrument our data stack and we wanted to uh, we wanted to really collect every piece of information we could about how users used our product so we could make it better and see what they're engaging with and what they weren't engaging with. Um, and and we started that process and we we brought in mparticle and initially we just brought in mparticle as like a data pipe uh and to take some of the load off of uh us and connecting with third-party partners um and and we started to really do some cool things with analysis and start to learn and, and it started to influence our product decisions and we started to become a more data informed organization um going further we started to realize the value of being able to connect these these kind of best in class marketing systems so that we could, uh, so that we can start personalizing your experience based on what we know you like. Um, so we went from just using our data as an analysis tool to taking M particle and kind of passing it in data back and forth. So for instance, right, we would do analysis in a tool we use called Interana, which is kind of our data analysis tooling. And we'd build cohorts in there and we'd pass it through M particle to something like a lean plum where we can do targeted in app messaging campaigns so that you we could let users know a new episode of Game of Zones is coming, or hey, you know, you're following this NFL team and NFL season team seasons wrapping up. We know that users that follow this NFL team also like to follow this NBA team, right? And so really starting to use uh, and particle to to start to do what I call like kind of mass personalization, where like co- big cohorting, 
And then I, I think the last step that we're kind of undertaking now is is driving into things like Snowflake, where we could build machine learning uh, on top of the data we collect using M Particle to to really person do one to one personalization of your app experience. So not we know you watch this video and we know you like this, so we're going to show you this video next. So really, uh, it really changed the way that we could use data to and, and kind of push our data around so that we can. Uh, personalize the experience for the user. So like the agility and flexibility, yeah. Uh, what about you, John? Yeah, so it's interesting. I would say we actually approached it from a similar standpoint. When we first started looking at MParticle, um, I was actually on the engineering team uh, prior to moving to product. And we were looking at, we have uh, almost 40 apps in market because we are five networks across almost you know nine or so platforms. Um, and because of that scale, uh, and because of the downstream, the the number of data recipients we have, we have CRM platforms, DMPs, we have analytics tool sets, we have BigQuery, we have a BI team, a research team. It goes to a lot of places. Uh, and maintaining all these integrations across all these applications became really problematic. So originally, we were looking at it from that standpoint, the pipes, right? Just like Ross said. Um, but as we've rolled it out and you know, seeing how easy it's been to actually, you know, get the value in the different tool sets. Um, it's also given us, um, uh, I think, more transparency to the data for the product team, right? We, there's more understanding of like how things are tracked, um, verifying the tracking. Um, it's very easy to do that. Um, passing that information to the different tool sets for the purpose of segmentation. As Ross said, we're also, we're using Lean Plum as well. So, getting that information into the different systems and being able to take advantage of it um, sooner um, has been has been much better um, compared to when we were sort of doing it piecemeal per platform. Um, and, you know, we tend to, we tend to switch platforms at times, different uh, tool sets downstream. So uh, it makes that piece of it much, uh, much easier, uh, less, uh, less of a need to have to do reintegration across all like 40 apps. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll add on top of that, like we, we talk about all these apps and what we haven't really touched on is any kind of pri is privacy um, yeah. and, and yeah. data. And what M particle has also helped us do is, is, kind of have a really clear idea of where all of our data is, mm -hmm. which makes GDPR and CPPA compliance uh, much easier because and uh, one control to the kind of the attribute level, which data goes where, and two, know where all that data is. So if we do need to kind of present it to a user or scrub it, we can, we can do that. Yep. Yeah, for sure. That, uh, you know, in the industry, right, never as, as, as more we get sophisticated with data, the winds of privacy are kind of, you know, going, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of strength behind those, uh, you know, mm -hmm. being sensitive to that and having those controls is important. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, I think Ross and Josh, you both of you guys, when you described sort of your journey using M M particle, right, it was like, you started off like, focusing on the infrastructure and like, all right, we have some infrastructure and then right over time, getting a little more sophisticated with what you can do with your data because the infrastructure made it easy and kind of, you know, uh, I think we've blogged about it on our blog is like, that's like the data flywheel effect is like the more you're, the more you do with data, then the more it has a compounding kind of uh, effect on, on things. You know, as you guys have been through those journeys using data for, for personalization analytics and uh, privacy controlling and such, is there anything that uh, jumped out as a surprise, you, you know, positively or negatively, like, oh, I didn't think that this is something that we'd encounter or, or be able to do? Uh, maybe, Ross, you want to take that one first? Um, one is, like, it, it, it's, it's so easy. Like, I was trying to figure out how I could use... Uh, kind of cohorts to do targeted ad buys against the same users. And uh, I was kind of putting together an engineering specification and and it turns out that I didn't actually need to write a single line of code, uh, which was uh, which was which was a nice surprise uh, from from the, the technical standpoint. But I I think it 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 really is that um, when you when you collect the level of data that M particle lets you collect and you 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 start to 
to get into this world where your organization, it trickles through your organization. So every product manager on our, in our group now understands not only the importance of data and how to collect it, but how to analyze it and then start just to understand what I kind of call being data informed, right? Where they don't use data to make decisions necessarily, but they use a combination of analytical data, anecdotal data, and their, their product sense to make much better product decisions. And it's, it's, I know this might sound high level, but it's, it's led to, to a better application because mm-hmm. uh, we have talented people that now have a deep understanding of our users and it just makes the development process easier. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I, I think previously, um, you know, on the product side, there were a lot of challenges to, to accessing the data. Um, there was a lot of questions. I think we relied on one or two individuals that really knew the most about the data infrastructure and what was being tracked. Um, and now just that transparency of us being able to go in and look and see, you know, with an, an application with a live data stream, be able to understand what's being tracked, what's not being tracked. Um, uh, it, it's really helped the team become just much more informed. Um, and ultimately it, it lets us uh, adopting uh, optimizely as well for experimentation. So we're doing full stack experimentation now. Um, we're much more focused on sort of, I think what the previous session talked about, like starting with a, a user problem first, having sort of hypothesis generation of how we're gonna potentially solve that problem um, and using that data to, to inform um, what's working and not working. Um, and I'd say one of the newer uh, features that we're starting to dig into is uh, on-end particles like the profile API, uh, which could ultimately solve a lot of our problems that we're solving with other tool sets. Um, we use a third party for like concurrency monitoring. There's just a number of things that um, we didn't really uh, think about how we could take advantage of it. And now we're starting to, to dig in there. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe maybe uh, last question, and maybe we'll. Uh, I see some questions from from the audience here, so we'll we'll take those in a moment. What do you guys see? You know, we're we're you know, we're seeing good, interesting stuff going on in the media space, and, and Quibi's launch with a very sort of relatively novel content format for sure. Uh, what do you guys see as kind of like the next couple of big changes you're you think you'll see in the media space over the next few years? Uh, maybe Ross, I'll throw that one to you first. Uh, I, I honestly, I think it's kind of the, the big one in my head is the rise of 5G. When you start to get low latency mobile and shared experiences on the go or in arenas or things like that become easier and, uh, and more reliable, uh, you're going to get you're going to see a whole new wave of innovation in the media space because they're not tied to these what are effectively fairly slow connections. Um, so it definitely it, it excited by that. Like what it unleashes is, is, is what I kind of said. It's like I'm in a stadium, right? And I want to play a game game during the uh, the the game, right? And uh, follow along with uh, you know is, is somebody said that their their son's a Buddy Hill fan, so I'll keep that going uh, in the chat. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, follow along with, you know, is Buddy Hill going to s- hit three three-pointers in this quarter? And you, you're playing games and you're engaging people in different ways uh, on their phones because there's not that, oh, you know, it's it's I, I just keep hitting refresh and refresh and refresh and nothing's happening. Um, I think that technology is going to change things a, a lot in uh, in our industry. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, I think specific to to where we are, um, what we talked about earlier related to how does like an owned and operated platform exist, but also off platform. So trying to make a big picture of of for the consumer, how does how does social connect all of these pieces, these disparate pieces today, which are disparate, um, and a lot of that is tied into getting our uh, different divisions right, our marketing product UX also in the previous session, they talked about that. How do, how do we get them all to speak to, you know, the same, the, tell the same story to the user. Um, whereas previously it was just driving to sort of one property to consume content that that's really going to be changing for, for many companies in the future. 
Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, I see some interesting yeah. questions uh, from the crowd here. So maybe let's dive into them. Um, this is the first one. Uh, you mentioned content. Well, actually, I mentioned. So I'm the one that dug up that quote from the year 2000, right? But content is the king in media. But uh, um, it's down to product delivered the content the right way. So this is an interesting one. How would you guys say that your approach as product managers has been shaped by your industry? I guess, especially if you talk to, you know, peers in, in this space who are, who are in different industries. Uh, maybe John, you can take that one first. So how has, sorry, can you repeat the, how, how has the fact that you're in the, the media industry, uh, ver, uh, been, uh, an influence on your approach to product management? Oh yeah. Um, well, I guess, I guess having that context, um, uh, on, in media there, there, you know, it's easy to say, um, to look at a Netflix application and say, we should just do what they're doing. But it's it's more complicated than that, both from a technology standpoint and a rights standpoint. Um, so I don't, you know, we don't necessarily own the rights to all of our content. We have to explain to the user that they need a cable account. There's there's a lot of limitations, and a lot of that has to do with the rest of the business, right? We're not just a mm. a new, you know, digital media company that's that stood up. We we are we have legacy components that still are an operating business. So how do we sort of balance between those? And uh, I think having media experience um, really gives you that context oh, as you go to, to work at a new media company, you, you bring all of that experience with you. I, I came from a company called TuneIn. We were an audio platform, similar, similar challenges where we didn't necessarily own all the content. A lot of the content were, were distribute, we were a distribu distribution uh, platform. So um, really understanding what those challenges are and, and how to work around them. Yeah. Any, anything on that, Ross? Uh, yeah. So, so like my personal journey, I came from uh, Open Table, where I was building uh, what was essentially very transactional, right? Uh, it, it, and and so my my goal there was to to get uh, people to kind of that decided they wanted to go out for to dinner to to book as as quickly as possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause, cause that's how we made money. Right. And that's, uh, that was the goal. Whereas here, I feel like my, my job is to get users to get lost in the experience. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, so it's, it's, what can I do to keep them engaged? What can I do to, to present interesting content? And it, and it's a, it's a very different mindset than that, that former transactional world. And, and, and in a lot of ways it's, it's, uh, more challenging because you can't just A/B test your way to it. You have to, uh, you really have to try to get your creative juices flowing. So it's something I, I actually really enjoy. Got it. All right. Well, if this was a Looney Tunes cartoon, you'd see like that thing like taking us by the neck and taking us off stage. <laughs> uh, I think we're at time. Uh, but Ross, John, uh, thank you so much for for these good insights. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. And I guess to everyone, I know there's a, a lot of questions that we didn't get to, but uh, you know, definitely you can find all of us on Slack. Uh, and certainly from the M particle perspective, we've got our, our virtual booth going. So uh, feel free to uh, meet us there and we can answer any questions you guys might have. But thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Good one.